Oh, welcome, Chris. I'm really excited to have you here today. Um, we've been trying to fix a time to have this talk for quite a long time. And for me, it was really important that um, people who don't know you and your work got the opportunity to get to know that. Um, it's something that's been and still is an anchor in my life. And uh, I'm really delighted to have you here today. Well, it's uh, good to be here. Mm. So what I really love is I think the kind of viewers that generally listen to my um, recordings and enjoy these conversations love to know about breathwork, but also they're generally equally interested in or curious about shamanism. And of course, um, first and foremost, I got to know you through shamanic practice. However, just to frame our first meeting, um, it was actually connecting us together through um, Yakov and Susanna, who were running, uh, I think it was initiation. It was a, a 10 day intensive. That's and right. you came in, yeah, you came in to do a piece of shamanic work. And I always remember Yakov saying, oh, I love Chris, he's great. He just comes in, he gets the job done, packs up his tools and goes off and there isn't much ego. And, and then when I met you, that's what I really experienced of the way that you work. You're very precise and very, um, organized in what you want to deliver and the transmissions feel really clean and clear and that particular structure that we did really stayed with me um, to the point where I then reached out to you wanting to um, start my one-year training and since then as you know um, I've gone on to do the three-year training with you and again this is for me is like shamanic practices really anchor me into uh, a mindful connection in my day-to-day -day life they probably do the same for you and I'm sure that your devotion and dedication is born of years of experience and um, because of that anchoring for me I really would love to share some of the things that bring meaning and importance in your life in your shamanic practices into this dialogue today and the reason for our viewers that I asked Chris to do this talk was because on the first module of the three year training, Chris made a comment about how the breath is at the foundation of all shamanic practice. And of course I scribbled that down eagerly and went running up at the end and said, can you say more about that? And um, so here we are today, kind of hopefully um, exploring a little bit more about the relationship between the breath and shamanism. And just to start this talk, Chris, I'd love to invite you to share a little bit um, about your, the way that you found shamanism and, and how your journey unfolded at the beginning of that. Because, you know, you're a storyteller and I've heard those stories. They're quite remarkable. And I know that your initiation, if you like, into shamanism came through a difficult experience for you. Would you like to share anything about that? Sure. Well, uh, my uh, way into shamanism, uh, I suppose there were uh, several steps and it was, uh, it was a gradual uh, process. But uh, like you say, uh, there was uh, definitely uh, uh, some uh, difficult uh, experiences that I had with uh, illness and uh, accidents that uh, uh, kind of began to open up the door for me. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there were uh, other experiences also. I remember I was up in uh, Lapland, in, uh, beyond the, the, the Arctic Circle, and uh, I did a vision quest. Uh, I had uh, read about the vision quest, so I uh, knew very little about it, just uh, a very uh, brief uh, description in a book. Uh, but based on that, I... I did one by myself. I didn't have any uh, guides or anybody uh, uh, help me do it. Uh, and uh, I was there for uh, four days and four nights without uh, drinking or eating. And uh, on the vision quest itself, uh, nothing uh, much happened as far as uh, I was concerned. But it was, uh, I think, in uh, 1980. And at that point, uh, there were American Indians who had uh, gone over uh, to Lapland and uh, joined uh, the, uh, the Sami people, the reindeer herders. So they were um, visiting there, but some of them uh, liked uh, the free lifestyle 
uh, that the, the Sami had and uh, had uh, actually settled there and uh, some of them had uh, married uh, into the, the Sami people. And as I sat up on a, uh, on a, an, on a top of a mountain on this uh, particular vision quest, at one point uh, I saw uh, a line of people walking like an Indian file, goose file, uh, below me and they uh, didn't see me uh, but I could see them uh, um, walk by and some of them were uh, Sami people and some of them were American Indians and uh, so that was kind of like the the high point of the the highlight of the vision quest and uh, uh, it uh, it made a big impact on me in, in that state of uh, having a uh, fasted uh, for uh, I think at that point uh, three days. So uh, energetically, it uh, it kind of uh, got me uh, started on the path, uh, so to say. And then um, I remember another uh, incident uh, at around the same time, but that that was when I was uh, back in uh, Denmark, and uh, I got home late one night, and I was. Uh, driving and uh, parked the car and when I stepped out of the car I heard uh, the hooting of an owl and it was uh, uh, probably early morning maybe 2 a.m. or something like that and uh, uh, there was this um, uh, it was not completely dark uh, it, there was enough light that I could see so I began to follow uh, the, uh, the call of the owl and uh, it led me into the woods. And uh, it was as if every time I came closer to the owl, it uh, flew further into the woods. And then I, I started running and, and following this uh, uh, call of the owl. And uh, I ended up by a, a big uh, boulder and uh, sat down by the boulder. And uh, there uh, I had uh, what I suppose you could call a, a shamanic experience uh, with uh, that uh, rock. And uh, it was the owl that uh, led me uh, to the rock. So that is, uh, that's uh, a couple of uh, uh, things that, that, that happened to me that uh, guided me onto the, the path. But like you said, also uh, illness and uh, accidents uh, had a, a big impact on me and uh, kind of made me question the, uh, the way I had been living up till then and then. Uh, uh, by looking within the, it, the doorway, it began to open, so to say. I love that. You know, I love that you say that that awareness and experience of accidents and illness and near death really um, made you open into the inquiry of, you know, how you'd been living and what life is like, which I think is a turning point for many people. It's certainly what brought me down here to Glastonbury, not through my own um, near death experience, but through experiencing somebody I love very dearly dying very young recently and kind of sharpen that focus somehow of going, Oh, hang on a minute. We never know how long we've got, you know, what, what's my legacy? What do I want to do? How do I want to live? Am I living in right relationship? So I love that that opened up for you. Um, I'd like to just backtrack a little bit to something you just said about um, how the vision quest when you saw those people and you saw the the goose file line of people that that really inspired you i'd love to know how did that then translate into action what did that vision then how, how did you know where to go to find what you wanted to study yeah well um because that line of people was a, a combination of the indigenous uh, uh, sami people from uh, Norway and then American Indians. Uh, I uh, I suddenly realized the link uh, between uh, you know where I came from and then uh, the Americas, and uh, it was as if that seeing uh, those people there made me on a deep level um, uh, have uh, established an intention to uh, go over uh, to uh, America and uh, uh, learn uh, about that, uh, that way uh, of uh, the native people. And uh, that's uh, one thing with uh, American Indians, uh, is that they, um, they have the old teachings intact. You know, where in, in Europe, um, 
you could say most of uh, the old ways, the old Germanic Germanic ways have uh, has been lost. But in the in the in the states and also Mexico, South America, it is still alive, and uh, there's a, a direct uh, lineage that has uh, not been broken. So uh, it was uh, it was uh, a, a good place to go to seek uh, uh, to learn about uh, shamanism. Mm, mm. I, I have a sense that some of these um, old European practices are, are currently in revival a little bit, that people are kind of looking for um, ways to relate to their own lands and to bring those ways back, you know, where languages were forbidden and where things were squashed because they were seen as threatening. I feel that they're coming back. But in your case, obviously, you went to somewhere where you're speaking about this direct lineage that's always been there. Now, for quite a long time, some of these lineages were very, very um, private. They wouldn't go out into the world. So some of the things I know that some of the things you teach, it's kind of like we don't have permission to go on and teach them elsewhere. And sometimes you don't have that permission yet. And you always respect and honor the teachings and which bits are appropriate to share and which bits you're able to share. And I, and I know that you've done a huge amount of your own kind of rites of passage and, and um, honoring and being honored within those cultures. You know, you've told some great stories. I love the story about the pipe and uh, your teacher. Um, tell me her name in her uh, native name. Uh, well, that, her name was uh, Mahajani. Mahajani, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did that you know you if you went over there did you how did you know where to start how did you know how to find somebody that would continue leading you along that path was it total trust uh it was uh completely based on trust yes when i got over there i had no connections i didn't know uh one single person in the united states when, when i got there and uh, uh, i um, very quickly began to run out of money also after I gotten over there. And uh, what happened was that I, I was at a, a health food uh, store and I saw a little notice uh, outside on the board. Uh, and uh, there was a gathering uh, further south uh, from where I was at that point there. And uh, I began to hitchhike uh, down towards that uh, gathering. And it was uh, uh, a gathering of um, uh, medicine people. Uh, that was open, uh, you know, to people from the outside, to non-native people also. And uh, as I was hitchhiking, uh, I got a ride uh, with um, uh, one of the instructors. Uh, he was uh, uh, somebody who was going to teach uh, bushcraft and uh, survival uh, skills, and he he was a soldier. Mm. And uh, he. Uh, he said I could stay in his uh, lodge uh, during the gathering, which uh, I did then, and that's how I got uh, to meet uh, all uh, the teachers at that gathering, because they all came to his lodge because he had the kind of food <laughs> that they wanted to eat. They didn't want to eat the, the, uh, the food that the, the organizers had provided, which was uh, entirely uh, vegetarian. So these native people here, they were not uh, vegetarian. So they would come into his lodge in the morning and they eat uh, dried fish with he, which he had uh, brought. And uh, uh, then I got to meet them and uh, uh, I, I was then invited to uh, uh, you know, go and uh, visit and uh, uh, stay with and learn from uh, mm -hmm. one of them. And then it, it developed uh, mm -hmm. from there on. Mm, mm, mm. And and it seems like you were were recognised by um, the people that you were meeting. Um, I know you told a story about somebody kind of really opening up to inviting you in to those learnings and those teachings. Do you feel that there was any particular reason that that happened? Uh, I don't uh, really know, but uh, um, like you said uh, a bit earlier, uh, if if you show uh, respect uh, to the people and uh, dedication, and if you show that you're willing uh, to work and uh, continue to work and uh, um, treat uh, the, the teachings and uh, the people with uh, respect, uh, uh, mm -hmm. then that um, 
is something that can uh, open the door. And uh, like you uh, mentioned before, uh, that I always uh, try to follow the, the instructions uh, from the elders and uh, share what I have uh, been given permission to share. And also to make sure that uh, it is not, uh, the teachings are not uh, used in a way that uh, can be uh, offensive to uh, the to the native uh, people so that basically mm -hmm. means that uh, you um, you become accomplished at uh, what you're working with before you start uh, sharing it and uh, uh, mm. uh, the the key word uh, is uh, respect yeah yeah uh, respect and humility um uh, the things I really see you modeling in how you deliver the work and the teachings. And I'm really glad that you made the point about, um, you know, not using the practices until you're accomplished, you know, because we all want to run before we can walk. You know, I've certainly been guilty of that. And I probably still am at times, you know, where I'm kind of like, yeah, 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 you know, this is so inspiring. I want to share this. And, and navigating that line between actually being humble enough to go, yeah, but have I learned enough yet? Yeah, but have I integrated these teachings? You know, you've been doing this for how many years now? Well, I started uh, the, the vision quest there was uh, in uh, 1980. And <laughs> then I, uh, I got to the States in uh, 1982. Right. So it's uh, 40 years, basically. Hmm. 40 years of practice and and I really would love our listeners to let that land um, because of course you started teaching before now so uh, it didn't take 40 years for the, for you to be able to start teaching but alongside your teaching I know that you are really devoted to your practices um, do you want to say anything about that and how that holds that um, integrity intact for you uh, well, uh, the the practices uh, for me means that, uh, and this is the way I was taught that, uh, you know, when you get up in the morning and you uh, connect uh, with the land, uh, with um, the earth, uh, the the sun, and uh, uh, whatever else uh, is in in uh, that area where you live, and uh, I have. Uh, uh, what I call uh, the the morning practice, and uh, uh, I do that every morning and uh, always have done. And the morning practice is uh, basically a way that uh, uh, you connect with yourself, but and uh, with the land, but also uh, you set a tone for the rest of the day, mm. so that you can live, you can walk that day in alignment uh, with the teachings and in alignment with the, the intention you have for yourself for that day. Mm -hmm. So uh, as, I, as I see it, the, the morning practice is uh, very, very important. Mm -hmm. And it also includes uh, uh, meditation, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, not necessarily uh, like meditation as we know it from, uh, 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 from the tradition from India, but uh, uh, more earth based uh, meditation that uh, can uh, be outdoors, for example, in nature. Mm, mm, mm. So really linking into the medicine wheel and how that affects and influences our walk through life, you know, in each direction, mm. having, a, uh, having a sense of what those key themes are, but also really honoring, you know, the trees, the, the rocks, you talked about that relationship with the rock and the owl that came to bring you that. And and I, I feel that when we're kind of really open to that connection and to listening, that somehow something, things just seem to drop through and land in the heart or land in the gut and in the place where our inner, inner tuition, our intuition is stronger than of the mind. But the mind is obviously a really useful ally to get things done. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes that's the bit that's unruly. And I think, you know, we, we don't live in a culture that has um, rites of passage or, or structured practices very often in the morning or in the evening before we sleep i know that you you do a, a clearing practice before sleep the setting of the sun and uh, we don't really have that in our culture but we also don't value youth or elders very much in in this culture so um i love the fact that you bring these teachings together and that you bring that into the practice because i think it's really important 
and whether somebody's doing it through meditation or doing it through mindfulness or is inspired by shamanic practice i feel like they're all ways that we kind of connect to something greater than our a sense of a world and a people that's greater than just our own little you know landscape in the immediate vicinity um i'd love to just come on to the breath now because i remember in that first session um of the three-year training and you made a comment about how the breath is the foundation of shamanic practice and i got really excited as a breath worker and teacher now and scribble that down and, and really wanted to know more um can you say a little bit about why the breath is so important in shamanic practice for you sure um well first of all um uh shamanism is a is a spiritual tradition and uh, uh, the word wind the word breath is connected um, to uh, shamanism in the way that uh, breath and wind uh, means uh, spirit also mm -hmm. so the word spirit has uh, implications that point it uh, towards the breath basically and uh, um, when psychically, if you uh, if you uh, observe something uh, die, like a, an animal or even a, a human, um, uh, people who have uh, done that kind of observation have reported that uh, when the last breath leaves the body. Uh, the spirit uh, goes with it so uh, uh, the the spirit uh, is very closely uh, connected uh, to the breath mm. and um, um, the, uh, there are languages uh, native languages where the word for uh, breath is the same word as the name for spirit and also the name for life force mm. And so that, that is kind of the first thing that even in the language, uh, shamanism is uh, very uh, connected uh, to the breath. And then um, shamanic practices include uh, the breath uh, also. Uh, for example, uh, soul retrieval. Uh, when uh, shamans do soul retrieval, uh, most uh, methods for soul retrieval includes that you um, you f first after having uh, found uh, the the soul part that has been lost and you bring it back uh, to the client you anchor it uh, in the client through the breath so basically you blow uh, the uh, returned soul piece into the client through uh, strong uh, breathing mm. and uh, uh, the same uh, uh, applies uh, when you do extraction. So uh, there are, uh, for example, in South America, there are uh, extraction methods where you use rocks, you use stones. And when the stone has picked up uh, the intrusive energy from the client, uh, the shaman then uh, holds the stone up uh, maybe uh, to a very particular direction and then blows through the stone, blows the illness out of the stone and uh, uh, let the, the illness go to a, a better place, a place where it uh, does no harm. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, in the Siberia, for example, and all the other places also, they will take um, alcohol, uh, very high percentage uh, alcohol in their mouth uh, as part of a healing ritual and then uh, blow it, blow the alcohol uh, out uh, over the, the client as a way of uh, purifying the energy mm. in, the, um, uh, in, in the aura uh, of, the, uh, of the client. So um, there, there are uh, a number of uh, healing methods where breathing is, is uh, a key element. And, uh, you know, there are sayings like uh, the spirit rides upon the wind in uh, the shamanic traditions. So uh, wind, uh, air, 
breath and the spirit are interlinked, uh, an integral mm. part of, uh, of shamanism. Mm, 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 mm. I know when we um, were working with recapitulation on the last module that we did, um, that's heavily based on breathing because with the movement from side to side as well and the breath out and taking things back, it really is a meditation with the breath, but with that awareness as well and the intention of what we're reclaiming. Um, and it sounds like there are a number of practices. You know, you've just talked about extraction, soul retrieval. I've mentioned recapitulation there. Um, and, and they're obviously at the foundation of the shamanic practices from what you're saying because of that link and that, that reverence for the spirit being carried on the breath. I love that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's correct. There are... Um healing methods you know that you do for yourself to clear your own past that is uh, based on uh, breath work and uh, uh, those healing methods uh, uh, origin in uh, Mexico apparently and even though they're they are the source of them are maybe a bit un unclear but uh, mm. uh, they uh, are definitely uh, methods that have been uh, revived today and are uh, used a lot today mm. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah yeah and you personally are um passionate about and inspired by the breath aren't you because on the module one of the three year which is different to when i did the one year i was really delighted that you were bringing in wim hof breath work at the breaks and um and starting our sessions with that as well because obviously there's a lot of information to absorb and a lot of cognitive process so for me it's always really yummy when we get to do some of the more physical stuff either the movement practices or the breath work you know because it it brings me back into the body um why did you decide to bring that in for yourself and then into the training uh, well uh breath work has always been a part of my uh, shamanic training like i remember uh, in the beginning of my training uh, i had a toothache and uh, uh i was with my teacher and uh uh, she said to me, breathe, you know, so uh, I began to use breath uh, as a way to control the pain from the toothache. And it, there were, you know, several days before I could get to a, a dentist. Mm -hmm. So I, I found that that worked. And then uh, later on, I had another teacher. And uh, when there were uh, challenging uh, situations that I had to uh, go into as part of my training, he said uh, for me to breathe deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm. So uh, uh, I began to uh, follow his instructions also there, and uh, so early on I I, um, I did a breath work. It was not a systematic like uh, Wim Hof's, but it was uh, it was just based on uh, breathing deeply and uh, uh, bringing more oxygen in, into the body. Mm. And then uh, when um, I came across uh, more recently Wim Hof. Uh, and uh, found out that he he began to offer uh, teachings on uh, his breath work. I signed up immediately because I could uh, I resonated with uh, what he was talking about, and uh, I could very much relate to that. And uh, also, he uh, his work is um, very nature based, and uh, there's a uh, there's a, a primal kind of energy in what he does and in also in his uh, kind of personality and his his way to convey it mm -hmm. uh, so i could uh, definitely relate to that you know because i i have a background where i've uh, trained with some native people uh, and they they have the same uh, some of the same uh, kind of uh, powers that uh, i could uh, see in him mm -hmm. so i i signed up uh, and uh, mm -hmm practiced uh, the breath work uh, for maybe uh, a few years or so before I, I then began to introduce it in the in the training groups uh, and I introduced it in the training groups because I could um, I could really see the the value uh, of it and uh, uh, and also uh, when I look at uh, western people uh, today with uh, this background that I have here it, it's obvious that uh, they don't generally breathe very deeply and uh, yeah so the breath is, uh, is shallow and uh, then there's a lot of consequences uh, uh, because of that 
Mm-hmm. So I, I felt that it was important in the in the shamanic training group that we we learn to breathe again. And of course, native people traditionally, those cultures that uh, the shamanic teachings come from, they uh, knew how to breathe. You know, because they lived on the land. They were they were gatherers. They were hunters. They they were running. They uh, lived in a in a natural way and. Uh, you know they carried uh, physically heavy heavy burdens, and that kind of lifestyle uh, teach you how to breathe. Uh, but uh, our uh, uh, sedate, like sitting still lifestyle today, kind of bypasses the breath, so that uh, we end up uh, uh, forgetting uh, how to breathe uh, deeply, and uh, mm-hmm. and then uh, our life force uh, drops and. Uh, uh, we lose uh, touch with uh, part of ourselves and part of our our power. Uh, I think because of that. So I see uh, the uh, breath work as a as a real key uh, key thing. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I I agree. And for me, it's certainly been life changing and transformative. Um, it anchors me into the present moment. And I love that you use the word primal in regard to Wim Hof's stuff as well and to native traditions where people are living in a much more closer relationship with the land and um, and a deeper understanding of the body and the passages of life and the changing of the seasons as well. Like we're, we're just kind of neutralized in a way because we're in um, houses that have central heating. We don't really have extremes. We're on technology a lot. We're not walking as much. and I went to see Wim Hof with a healthy dose of skepticism and I was really pleasantly surprised when I actually got there. Um, You know, the stadium was full of so many people. But what I really noticed was that there was probably like 70% kind of, you know, young to middle-aged men in the audience. And these were people who were very attracted by the primal elements and the kind of, you know, the ability to really push the body, to biohack, if you like, into the body and into the system. But what I loved about him was that he really connected that audience who might not otherwise um, reach uh, some of these teachings into a sense of marriage with spirit and the soul. Um, So he really talked about why he does that and kind of what it brings up for him. And it wasn't just all about machismo and kind of, oh, look what I can do. It was the opposite of that. In fact, he was really teaching people to build a relationship with their body and to listen to the wisdom of the body. So my friend and I were just going, Oh, he's talking about what we talk about in our work and we just thought it would all be performance-based stuff and it really wasn't so yeah um i agree i think it's a really really important foundation of how we live and of how we can self-regulate and bring in health and vitality mm, yeah so, yeah 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 and i think uh, what you say there is um exactly right because uh, the the gentle approach that you're talking about and the the receptiveness and the the kind of feminine uh, power that uh, that implies needs to be balanced also with that uh, stronger uh, way that uh, Wim Hof also uh, uh, mm-hmm. kind of teaches and uh, the more challenging uh, way so. Um, if you only have one, there will be an imbalance. Both need to be there in order for there to be wholeness and balance. Yeah, absolutely, they do. You know, um, listen, Chris, I'm aware we've probably been chatting for quite a while, and I'd really like to give you the opportunity to share anything. I know you have a one year training coming up, and um, you often run trips and expeditions to um, Finland and uh, recent, more recently, Mongolia. Is there anything that you'd like to share about your work here? Uh, sure. Um, I have been uh, doing uh, expeditions in uh, Lapland and uh, other places for uh, about 20 years here. And uh, it is a, um, a way to um, take uh, the shamanic teachings uh, into the wilderness where they really uh, origin. You know, this is where the uh, where they came from originally, and uh, there's something very different about being in a primordial forest uh, when you come from, a, you know, a Western uh, civilization, and then you go into a primordial 
for is the primordial landscape. You, uh, you begin to connect uh, to uh, something within yourself that uh, knows that power that you can find uh, in, uh, in the wilderness. And uh, uh, it, uh, it awakens uh, something, it awakens the remembrance also uh, uh, of uh, who we really are mm -hmm. and where we come from. So uh, the uh, expeditions uh, can uh, can offer uh, that, and the the last one here was in uh, last summer was in uh, Mongolia, where we uh, 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 were hiking for uh, for two weeks and then uh, canoeing afterwards for uh, for two weeks, uh, and uh, it was uh, a very transformative experience and uh, usually the uh, uh, the expeditions into the uh, uh, the wilderness uh, can open that door of uh, transformation because you you connect to something that uh, you are not uh, connected to in your everyday life and also uh, because of the challenges that uh, come from being uh, in the wilderness and needing to su survive and maybe Maybe you wake up one morning uh, and there's snow on the ground and your water bottle has frozen uh, solid. Uh, so uh, you, uh, everything uh, becomes very real. Life becomes very real in that kind of uh, situations. Mm. So that is uh, something uh, that uh, I uh, offer in the, usually in the summer. And like you said, uh, I do uh, training groups, uh, a one-year training uh, that will begin in, in June here in uh, 2020 and then uh, the following year uh, a three-year training that uh, begins in the uh, autumn mm -hmm. and i really recommend these trainings everybody um i'm going to drop a link down to northern drum which is um chris's school of teaching um just below this recording so keep an eye out and any information you can get there from the website about what's on and what's coming up um I've done a vision quest with Chris. It was the toughest thing I've ever done in my life. It brought up all of my stuff. It really showed me where my edges are. So even in that context, you know, and that wasn't a trek and a hike through all of the conditions that you've talked about, although there were some conditions to deal with. Um, but just that sense of being so like committed to being in those practices and those experiences, you're absolutely right. It ignites something because it really shows us where all of our uh secret stuff is lingering and hiding because there isn't anywhere to hide from it when you're really focused on just meeting those very basic needs for food shelter water heat whatever it is that you need so um yeah i really uh hope that um many people find their way to your teachings because i've certainly experienced the value of them and thank you so much for agreeing to come on and chat, Chris. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do more in the future if something else arises, but thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure.